if the person is adjudged guilty, then censures are brought. You might say the the lesser censures of, of something like an admonition or rebuke or graver censures, which would be suspension uh, from the table of the Lord, removal from church office, and the gravest censure, of course, is excommunication, uh, when someone remains persistent and impenitent uh, in their sin. Welcome to Mid-America Reform Seminary's Roundtable Podcast, a broadcast where the faculty of Mid-America discuss everything from Reformed theology, cultural issues, and all things seminary. This is episode 89, and I'm your host, Jared Luchibor. Thank you for tuning in. Continuing in his series on church discipline, Dr. Alan Strange moves forward in describing it in the lives of church members. That is, how discipline is both sought for, but also imposed. What does that all mean exactly? Here's Dr. Strange to explain. Well, it's good to be back with all of our listeners to continue to think about the subject of discipline. And we saw a few things last time, particularly that it's one of the three marks of the true church and how those marks even function with respect to the attributes of the church, but particularly uh, what discipline is. Uh, that discipline is really in the in the broadest sense and in the first sense involves discipleship, which we're all engaged in. And I specifically said too, and I want to unpack this a little bit now, that discipline uh, could either be sought for or imposed. And when we say that discipline could be sought for, again, we're thinking about that broader meaning. Uh, Think of it this way. Discipline is ordinarily effectual and formative in the lives of those who pursue and seek it, who want lives characterized by trust and obedience. So if you're, if you're seeking this, if you want to follow Christ properly, uh, you want this discipline in your life. You, you, you want uh, the, the disciplines. And how does this come? Well, the ordinary public means of the formation of Christian character, as we've indicated, uh, as we've hinted at, are the public means of grace. We speak of the means of grace, and that is the reading and especially the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, That is the first primary means of grace. Second, uh, allied to that are the sacraments, uh, as it's put in the Westminster Larger Catechism. One of the great questions there um, in 167 is we're asked about the improving of our baptisms. How do we improve our baptisms? And that's a great uh, description of discipleship, of walking more and more with the Lord um, and the realization and the fellowship and communion of God with his people. So the sacraments involved that, that we commune with God and each other and we grow more and more in that. And then the third means of grace. Now, remember, uh, we, we, we earlier were talking about marks of the church, and that was word, sacraments, and discipline. Now we're talking about means of grace, and we're talking about some of the same thing. So it could be a, a little confusing, but the means of grace are word, sacraments. And I'm a Presbyterian, and I believe there is a third important means, prayer especially for the spiritual growth of ourselves and others. Note especially the prayers of Paul. You can think of the prayers of Paul, and there's been work done on that uh, in his epistles, and how he prays for the churches to which he's writing, and particularly how he prays for their sanctification, for their growth in the grace and the knowledge of God. He's praying that they be more and more disciples of Christ, that they grow in that. And so we can think about that uh, not only in terms of the public uh, administration of this, but we can think of it privately and personally, right? Uh, we, uh, we engage uh, in the, what the older writers would call the private duties of religion. And to use, again, that older language, they would say each in his own closet, in other words, our personal devotions, our reading of the word, our reading of sermons, our reading of other Christian literature, our prayer. This is a part of our formation. 
Uh, we often rec- recognize the importance of daily pursuing these sorts of things. Then Bible reading and prayer in our families, family devotionals, whether it's uh, after dinner in the evening, as it is for many people, when they pull out God's Word and begin to read it. Um, but it's even broader than that. Deuteronomy 6 talks about as we walk along the way, how you're to teach your children and parents talking to their children, whether it's at the table, the dinner table, or in other occasions, talking to their children about school, about church, what they learn in personal and family devotions. Um, For example, at Sunday, we would always, when our kids were at home and and younger, uh, Sunday dinner would typically be uh, which is to say Sunday lunch or dinner, the midday meal. I'm from the South. So the midday uh, Sunday meal, we would talk about, we would begin by talking to all the children about what they did in Sunday school. What did they learn in their Sunday school class? And then what did they learn from the sermon? It, it would, it might have been, I, I may have been the preacher of the sermon. It may have been uh, our pastor, um, But what did you get out of the sermon? What were the theme and the points of the sermon? That's part of discipling, taking that home to them. And then uh, Saturday evening, usually, we would have our pastor would send out what his text would be, hymns would be, maybe an outline, and we would read the scripture passage for the sermon on Saturday night. So they would be ready for that. They would be, you're going to hear about this. And here are some things to look for. Here are some things to listen for. That's all part of the family disciplining the children. Again, don't just think of disciplining the children because they're throwing their rice at the table and now they're going to get some some discipline for that. Yes, they will be they will be given some correction for throwing rice into their brother's hair. But um, we want to think of discipline in a broader sense. Discipline can and also does include when disobedience manifests itself, censure from others. So we've talked about sought for discipline, and now we're talking about what most people think about when they think about church discipline, which is imposed discipline. And we can think about that in two ways. We can think about that sort of discipline informally and formally. And I think it's very important that we think informally first, because again, we can just go to the formal and we miss the informal, especially in our churches. I think there are other kinds of churches, other kind of evangelical churches, where they talk a lot about one anothering, where they talk about ministering to one another, um, that, that we can sort of miss and just resolve everything into the formal. And I don't think that we should do that. Um, I think we should, should pay attention at both levels, you might say, the informal and the formal. What do I mean by the informal? Well, a friend challenging, encouraging, even rebuking. I, a, a friend of mine in the church, two brothers in the church, let us say, brothers in the Lord, one should be able to say to the other, should you speak to your wife that way? A really good friend should be able to say, one Christian man should be able to say to another Christian man, should you speak to your wife that way? And the response, it isn't a biblical response to say, that's none of your business. It may be an American response. It may be a fleshly response. It's not a biblical response. Um, because if we look at, at, at Matthew 7 and we look at Galatians 6, yes, we need to make sure that we take the that we attend to the telephone pole in our eye before we deal with the speck in our brother's eye. And Galatians 6 says, you who are spiritual ought to do this, but we shouldn't let those warnings of how we engage each other about sin that we may see in each other's lives, we shouldn't let that warn us off altogether because the intention is that we that we would be speaking into each other's lives. Um, and, and so the scripture says, well, here's how you do it with a mind and an eye to your own sin. Don't, I shouldn't speak to you, Jared, about your sin. You shouldn't speak to me about my sin without being aware of your own sin. But the Bible isn't saying, don't ever say anything to each other about sin that you might see in the life of another. It's not saying that. Or you say, well, shouldn't it be an elder or pastor? It can be a friend. 
but it can be an elder or pastor. And that's still informal. Notice this. It may carry a little more weight, right? Uh, Our form of government for the OPC specifically says elders are to seek to resolve matters before bringing it to the session. So if an elder sees something, they're not just to immediately bring it into the session and report to the session, member X was doing Y and needs to be spoken to. He's supposed to engage that person. It's very clear, according to our order, that he's supposed to engage that person and seek to deal with them. Seek the, 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 we're going to hear this as we go through this. Uh, we're probably going to need more than three talks if we really get into this. But one of the great principles of church discipline is always understood as we do as Reformed and Presbyterian. One of the great principles is it always ought to be as personally as possible and as locally as possible. The notion that, you know, I just saw my brother or my sister do X, and now the way I help discipline them is go tell it on the mountains. No, you're supposed to go tell the gospel on the mountains, but you're not supposed to tell perceived faults or sins of your fellow Christians on the mountains. You're to deal as personally as possible. And so you deal with them personally. If you're a member and you're not sure what you should do about what you've seen, you could speak to an elder, speak to a pastor about advice, and they may say, well, here, let me go and speak to the person. There's so many uh, variables here. And, you know, we, we, we can talk, and it would be good to talk about, I'm not sure if we're going to have the time in these three, to talk in detail about Matthew 18 and some of these other passages of how to really work this out. But that's an informal approach. And then there's a more formal approach, right, where the church acting in a judicial capacity takes something up. It presumes, I would say, and I think it should presume, that informal approaches have failed. It's sort of like the first step of Matthew 18, which is if your brother sins against you, go personally and privately to him, speak to him about it, and if he hears you, you've won him. Or then take a couple of others if he if he will not hear you. And that doesn't mean you just go once necessarily and say, okay, we go to the second step. You, you ha- this all has to be done very thoughtfully with wisdom. And it's also not the case that the second step is a group of your friends to beat him up. They're witnesses. It could be at the second step when you go hear someone, those that you ask to come along could look at you and say, well, that's not really a sin, what you're accusing him of. That's the 11th commandment. It's not one of the 10 commandments. Um, Or didn't you just hear he ask your forgiveness and you're not say you're not forgiving him this he's trying to resolve this don't you see that so in other words that can be part of that we might say then the 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 third step is where formal discipline comes in when it says tell it to the church and tell it to the church does not mean and again this this could be several talks on this and i've written about this tell it to the church does not mean as reformed and presbyterian understand it that you go after going through the first two steps you go and tell everybody in the church it means you tell the representative leaders you tell the minister and elders you tell the consistory you tell the session what's happening and what's going on. That's what it means to tell it to the church. Again, I recognize that this requires some some work to understand what that means precisely, and there are some differences among people. And if you do, as you go and you tell the session, the consistory, and they get involved, as the judicatory engages this, if they're convinced that the person is guilty of a sin, now that that's a whole nother question. If the person says, I'm not guilty, I didn't do this, you have to have some kind of process, some kind of due process, some kind of trial to, to demonstrate that they did. The purpose of an ecclesiastical trial or something like it is to establish the facts of the case because they're in dispute. They're in dispute. The person is saying, no, I didn't do it. Now, most sorts of situations, people will say, I did it. 
or they will they will acknowledge things. So that's that's what you have in most cases. But in the case where somebody doesn't acknowledge it, what do you just do? Say, well, no, we know you did it. Well, if it's a personal private thing, you don't know that they did it. It has to be established. So the purpose of something like a trial, some people don't like to call them trials, whatever you want to call it, is to establish the facts of the case and apply the law of the church to the case. That's the twofold purpose of some kind of procedure or trial. Establish the facts and apply the law of the church. And then if if this person is found, uh, if the person is adjudged guilty, then censures are brought. Um, you might say the, the lesser censures of, of something like an admonition or rebuke in a formal way, and uh, the the OPC defines that in its book, or graver censures, which would be suspension uh, from the table of the Lord, removal from church office, uh, or suspension in church office or removal from church office, which is called deposition. Um, so those sorts of suspensions are, are graver censures, and the gravest censure, of course, is excommunication, uh, when someone remains persistent and impenitent uh, in their sin. Well, having talked about informal discipline and formal discipline that is imposed, not necessarily sought for, we can take up next time something of the practice of this informal and formal discipline. Stay tuned next time as Dr. Strange explores this practice of church discipline as well as the basis for church discipline as it is found in scripture. For more episodes, you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcasts and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reform Seminary's Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchbor. Till next time.